Hello again, you lovely game dev people. So far in this series, we covered a lot of ground in terms of background information about the Unreal Engine, how to get it installed, and some of the most important classes you might encounter. We have covered some of the files that make up your Unreal projects and how they work with an IDE, before going on to make some simple coding examples, a blueprint library in C++, and adding some functions to it. The point of all that wasn't to teach you to try and do all your C++ development in blueprint libraries though. Now that we have those basics under our belt, we can cover more specific areas of functionality, what you can do with them, and how to use them. In the next few videos we're going to cover some of the most commonly used classes in Unreal, what they're useful for, and how to work with them. We're going to begin with a clean slate, an empty Unreal project. We will add the code we need to it step by step, and I will do my best to try and make the videos modular, so you can jump into what you need when you need it. So let's do this. In the previous video, I showed you how to make a new Unreal project. Once again, I'll use the Epic Launcher. I click Launch to open the editor without a project, and after a brief load, I get the Unreal Project Browser. So I click the Games topic and select the blank Project Template. In the Project Defaults, I change the project from Blueprint to C++. I'll leave the other Project Defaults as they are. In this case, Target Platform Desktop, Quality Preset Maximum, Starter Content Off, and Ray Tracing Off. So now, I just need to confirm that the project location is what I I want and give the project a name. I'm going to call my project Building Blocks. I hit the Create button and let Unreal do its thing. In the first video in this series, I talked about the Game Mode class, and I mentioned that when making a C++ project, it isn't hugely useful to create your own one using C++. The default C++ project template makes one for you though. I don't actually want it, so the first thing I'm going to do is delete it. You don't have to delete yours though. There is no actual problem having it around, just don't use it if you don't want to. If and when you feel comfortable doing so, perhaps you might actually add your own code to it, and try for yourself to see if you like using it. Each map you make, a game level specifies in its world settings which game mode it will use. If you're using Rider, you can just click the files with the project game mode .h and .cpp and select edit delete. The solution will be updated for you automatically. Be aware that this approach won't work in the default Visual Studio experience though. In Visual Studio, deleting a file from the Solution Explorer does not actually delete the file. It just excludes it from the project's solution. Because Unreal doesn't actually use the solution for compiling your game, this means it will still use that file and you won't understand why. Worse still, the next time the solution is refreshed somehow, the file will magically reappear in the Solution Explorer and you might end up tearing out your hair trying to figure out exactly what is going on. If you want to delete source code files when you're working with Visual Studio as your IDE, my recommendation is to do it manually from the file browser. Right click on the file that you want to delete in the Solution Explorer and choose Open in Explorer. This will open a file explorer window in the relevant source directory. Manual file manipulation. If you ever feel like you want to manage source code files yourself, manually, then you can find them in the source directory, located under your project's main directory. Just remember, if you do add, rename, or delete files in the folders, or move anything around, you will need to right click on your .uproject file, and choose Generate Visual Studio Solution, so that the solution is updated to reflect your manual changes. OK, so we are running a stripped down, ultra basic project so we can get to grips with the features of important Unreal classes, so that the tutorial project doesn't look too cluttered and you can concentrate on what we're most interested in. We're going to need a map to test our work on. Unreal has already created one for us when we made the game, but unfortunately, rather than the default being rather dull, clean, empty canvas, Unreal is kind of showing off. It's created a map with a large landscape geometry with mountains around the edges. Don't get me wrong, this is actually pretty useful playground later on. It's got a circle of mountains in the distance and a nice flat area in the middle. You can place buildings in it, run about over it, it's big enough to drive cars around on, you could even land a capital ship on it. But right now we want something we made ourselves, so we can see how it all hangs together. I would like to have some sort of order to the assets in my project, so I first create a map folder. 
Some people like to create a very specific structure of folders for the content of their Unreal projects. You can do that too if you like. You can easily find several different versions of these if you do a web search. Me, I prefer to just make the folders I require as I go along using a kind of common sense approach. Do whatever works best for you. It's a similar story regarding how you name things. And yes, I have my own way of naming things. For example, I don't pluralize folders because everything would have a pointless S stuck on the end of it, but that's just me. My way is going to be different than other developers, and it isn't going to agree with various game studio standards or even those of Epic themselves. And I'll probably do things slightly differently from one project to the next. That's just how I roll. Yeah, I know. Somebody stop him. He is out of control. Honestly, regardless of what all the various experts say, how you name things really is not generally all that important as long as you give things valid names. It's nice for your own sanity to have a sensible folder structure, but you really don't need to obsess too much over that either. Likewise, if it makes you sleep better at night to prefix all your assets with MAT underscore for materials or BP underscore for blueprints or W underscore BP underscore for widget blueprints, then you go right ahead. But understand that's primarily just for you and your OCD. Unreal doesn't care about it at all. In fact, Assets have metadata which lets Unreal and the editor know exactly what they are, which is why you can filter for specific types of asset using the content browser. It has nothing to do with how you name them, so arguably you're wasting your valuable time and energy with all these prefix nonsenses anyway. Having said that, the way you name things and exactly what you call them can be useful. For example, if you include something descriptive in the name, such as a texture called green glass window, then you are able to filter on textures in the Unreal editor together with a keyword for either green or glass, which is kind of useful, especially in larger projects with more assets. In a nutshell, asset pre and post fixes saying what the asset is are basically a pointless exercise in obsessive compulsive disorder, Asset naming, including descriptive things you can search on, are useful. But ultimately, now you know that, you go right ahead and follow whatever standards you prefer, or just name things however you like. OK, so I go to the menu and I choose to add a new level. The new level will use the blank template, so we get basically nothing. I'm going to want to save this level into our map content folder. And in this case, I'm going to call it default BB. Then from the main menu, I select Window Environment Light Mixer. So be able to see things when we add them to the level. The Environment Light Mixer is a great feature that Epic added to the editor. Basically, it groups together a lot of commonly used objects related to the environment lighting of your current map into a single place. As you click each of the buttons, you can see exactly what is added in the world outliner. Create a skylight, create an atmospheric light, sky atmosphere, volumetric cloud, and a height fog. Many of these things work together to create the overall light effect in our level, but we're not interested in any of that right now. One more thing we want our simple test level to have is some kind of floor so that eventually we have something for the player to stand on. There are several ways that you can add objects, actors, to your level using the editor. The two most common are the place actors browser interface and the quick add menu. The quick add menu has an icon with a cube and a little plus on it. Clicking it drops down a menu of options from which you can select shapes and then plane. Alternatively, if you are going to be adding adding many different things to your level, you might want to enable the Place Actors browser. If it's not already visible, from the main menu, click Window, Place Actors to display it. By default, it usually appears on the left of the main viewport, but you're free to drag it around and dock it wherever you want, like the majority of Unreal Editor windows. So with that now displayed, you can click the little cube button tooltip shapes with the Place Actors browser. Clicking or double clicking the plane won't actually do anything. You have to drag the thing you want into the level and drop it. However you got there, you should now have a plane in the level. If you select the plane, I prefer to use the outliner for selecting most things. In the details, we can check that the plane is located at 0, 0, 0. If it isn't, and mine wasn't, click the little reset type arrow thingy next to the property to reset it. Then, because the plane is a little bit small, make it a little larger by entering a scale of 10. The padlock, if unlocked, allows you to edit the individual scale axis properties and, when locked, means you can edit any one of them and it will lock the same scale change to all the others. Clicking the padlock toggles the locked unlocked state. And yes, if you first enter three different values into the individual property components and then lock it, when you subsequently change a value, they will all be scaled relative to the change. Someone at Epic took the time to code that, so, madam or sir, whoever you are, I tip my hat to you. 
Anyway, the first three classes we are going to work with are used as default settings by the Game Mode class. Those classes we are interested in are the Pawn class, a Player Controller and a HUD class. Just a quick refresher. We will make a Pawn class to represent the player in our game. In this example, we will derive our Pawn from a character, which itself derives from a Pawn, but has some extra bits added in by Epic to represent the most common things you might want in games with humanoid characters. But in the spirit of keeping things simple, we won't give it any animations or anything too clever. A player controller class derived from a player controller will deal with handling input from the player and knowing what to do with it. In some cases that will be telling the player character to move when the player gives a movement action such as pressing a button to jump but the player controller can also receive any other actions which need other responses such as telling our HUD class to display or hide an on-screen menu when the relevant button is pressed on a gamepad or keyboard. We will be using the enhanced input plugin for our input which Epic gave us as part of the loveliness of UE5, although it was available in the last couple of versions of UE4 too. Enhanced input is great. It can seem a little confusing at first, especially as regards using it with C++, but once you get the hang of it, it really isn't too tough to wrap your head around. And don't worry, I'm going to walk through all of it step by step anyway. We will make a HUD class derived from a HUD. HUD classes are intended to be the place where you control which user interface features are displayed on the screen. And this is often things letting the player know how much health they have, or ammo, or money, or which compass direction they're currently pointed in, that sort of thing. It's a useful centralised location to have functions which update those user interface elements, widgets, when data changes, and control which ones are displayed or hidden at various times as your game is played. And of course, a HUD isn't much use without some widgets to display information, so we'll create something for that too. It doesn't really matter what order we create those classes in, and there are different ways to do so. As we have three different classes we need to make, I'll show you the process using the Unreal Editor, Visual Studio and Rider. First, using the Unreal Editor to make a new Pawn class to represent the player. In the Content Browser, navigate to the C++ Classes folder. If you can't see that folder in the Content Browser, it might be turned off for viewing. You can make it, and a few other things appear, by clicking the Settings icon in the top right of the browser window. From the menu that appears, just under about halfway down, there is a section marked Content. In this case, we want to ensure that the Show C++ Classes option is ticked. I also usually keep the Show Engine Content and show plugin content selected too, as I structure most of my projects with plugins, and the engine content has a lot of useful stuff provided by Epic in it which you can use yourself. Note, if you have enabled the show C++ classes option, and you still don't see the C++ classes folder in the content browser, then the editor might have gotten its panties in a bunch. In such cases, from the Unreal Editor's main menu, you can click Tools, New C++ Class, which will also open the wizard. After you create the new class, Unreal will probably get its act together, appropriately adjust its undergarments and display the C++ classes folder for you with the new class inside it. In the C++ classes folder there is a subfolder with the name of our project. Inside that I right click in an empty space and select the new C++ class option. Up pops the new class wizard and Epic have given us a few commonly used choices right there so that we don't need to go searching through the entire list of all classes provided by the engine, plugins and our own code. Character is the second choice in the list and scrolling a little bit you would find both player controller and HUD also in this list which isn't surprising because they are commonly used. So I click on character and hit the next button. Ok, let's take a second to talk about this wizard. The only time I ever use it myself is uh, when I'm making these videos, because it's much faster for me to work within my IDE to add new classes. But also, I'll come right and admit it, when I started doing C++ with Unreal, this thing kind of confused the hell out of me. Why you ask? It looks kind of simple. Well, there are in my opinion several problems with it, especially if you're new to Unreal. It's not very intuitive, it lacks appropriate descriptive explanations, it assumes too much foreknowledge because it is a wizard, remember, and it does not present you with everything you would actually need to use it in all cases. Allow me to somewhat rant for a moment, if you will. There is a block of header text which talks about how it will create .h and .cpp files and that the name can't contain invalid characters, but it explains nothing else. There's a public-private toggle button thing which starts with neither being selected, but as soon as you select one you cannot unselect one. I say starts with, but that might only be true if you didn't already make something using the public-private folder structure, because if you did it might default to public instead. Manually editing the path may have the effect of unselecting one, but why would anyone new to Unreal guess that they needed to do such a thing? Public and private are labelled class type, which is also misleading, as well you could argue about that, as 
far as the actual code goes, they are almost the same. The actual difference is being a macro slipped into the class declaration, which newcomers might easily miss, and the placement of the generated files in folders named public and private. There is a text box for entering a new class's name, and immediately after that, there's a drop down with no label at all, which, when you eventually understand these things, you will realize allows you to select which module in your project's code you want to create the new class inside. However, there is no ability to actually specify a new module, and as far as I'm aware, there is no option to do this from inside the Unreal Editor anywhere at all. Wait a sec, I can make a new plugin from the editor, but I can't make a module? How does that make any sense? This UI just assumes you know what's going on, and if required, have created a new module somewhere else before this. And if you're able to have done that, it kind of begs the question as to why you'd want to use this wizard in the first place anyway. Now, yes, I will admit, there is some extra information you can get about this interface. Some of the elements do have tooltips. All in all, I don't have high praise for the class wizard. Sorry, Epic. You know I still love you, but this needs work, please. It's important for helping new devs get on board, and it's part of the friction that has turned many people away from using the engine in frustration. If you want to do something cool, you know that environment light mixer thing we used earlier? Get whoever made that to do a new code mixer thing. My suggestion? Add new classes, add new modules, delete classes and modules, change your mind if a class is public or private after you've already made it, and if you really want to throw a bunch of love at such a feature, you could even let the users manage public private dependency module names from the same interface visually, allowing the user to filter the modules by engine, project, plugin, etc. And if you really must add comments to the header files like called every frame to the tick method, then also add one above the class declaration, describing that the module name underscore API is there because it's public. Or if it doesn't have one, put a comment in to say it's private. That might help beginners, and it wouldn't hurt those with more experience either. Okay, so now that that's out the way. Let's actually use this thing. First, let's deal with the public, private, not set thing. If you are making a very simple game where you are not interested in splitting your code between different modules, then you don't need to click on the public, private thing. The path used, unless you alter it, will most likely be your project folder slash source slash your project's name. I've talked a little about modules before in my earlier videos, and they really are a very important part of coding C++ for Unreal, as are plugins too. These are topics that deserve their own video, which is going to be part 7 of this series, I think. For now, we will just have our new source code files added to the root source code folder. So I'll click into the name text entry box and edit the contents to say... Bleh, character BB. Everything else can be left as default. I click create class and let Unreal do its thing. Once Unreal has created the new class code files and updated the project, you can switch back to your IDE of choice and you should see them. If you can't see them, it means the IDE needs to update itself with the latest SLN file and generally that happens automatically now, but if it doesn't, you might need to reopen your IDE or simply reload the solution or refresh it somehow. The exact method might vary from one IDE to another. So, okay, in our solution, in the root project source folder, we have the default module folder with the same name as the project. And inside that, the new files for the character BB class .h and .cpp. Using Rider to make the new player controller to handle player input. In the Rider IDE, in the Solution Explorer window, right click on the folder with your project's name inside the project solution folder, like so. Select Add and then Unreal Class from the menus which pop up. This opens the new Unreal Class tool. In the class name field, I'm going to enter the name Player Controller BB. In a real project, I'd more likely be bothered to think of some kind of better name than that. For parent class, we want Player Controller, but wait, it isn't in the list of common classes. Come on now, JetBrains, you're letting the side down. You really think, what is this, sound effect submix is more common than player controller? Fail! Fine, I guess I'll have to switch to the all classes list and find it myself then. Pfft, gotta do everything myself. So I type player controller in the search and there it is, a player controller. Hang on, wait a sec, JetBrains. The classes in the all classes list are obviously taken directly from all the classes available to the project and so have the actual names as we see them in C++. So a pawn, a player controller, you object, etc. So why then in the common classes list have you hidden the a or u prefixes for everything, but worse still, kept it for the u object class. Inconsistent! Do better! Wow, I'm just so critical today. Maybe I should eat something. I'm just gonna throw together a quick sandwich. Could be a good time to subscribe if you didn't already. I mean, only if you want to. No pressure. Okay, so um, I'll leave the base folder as root, which is uh, incidentally what you get when you don't click on something in the new C++ class wizard. I'll leave the path alone and click OK. A couple of seconds later, we have our new class created and we can see the playercontroller.h and .cpp files. 
right next to the character BB files we made earlier, which leaves us using Visual Studio to make a new HUD class to handle the UI elements. It's a fairly similar story to the situation in Rider. I right click on the project name source folder and select add and then Unreal Engine class and up pops the add new item window. The experience in VS is going to be a little more DIY than in Rider though. We only have a choice of four options, an empty class, an actor class, a character class and a pawn class. And since we want to make a HUD, which isn't an actor character or pawn directly, I'm going to choose empty class to show you how you can set the file up yourself. The next page lets us enter the name of the new class. In this case, we're going to stick with our premium naming convention and call it HUD BB. You can also select which folder you want to create the files in, which is kind of pointless because we started the whole operation by right clicking on where we wanted to put them anyway, but whatever. Note there is no public private business going on here. It's not even presented to you as an option. The path chosen is where both files get created. You can move them later if you understand how it works and you want to do that. I'll leave the refresh IntelliSense checkbox ticked and click OK. And crikey, what's it doing? Hmm, Visual Studio is completely locked up. Oh hey, no, it's come back. Wait, no, it hasn't. OK, now it's back again. That was painful. Maybe it was the refresh IntelliSense business. OK, without the refresh IntelliSense fiasco, it was almost instant, so take from that what you will. Because we are creating an Unreal class and we chose empty class, we assume we will get some kind of boilerplate inheriting from uObject, because that is the base class for all Unreal classes. And if we just wanted to create a plain old vanilla C++ class, well, we wouldn't be using the Unreal class option now, would we? Except we don't get either of these things. Visual Studio has given us something inheriting from a character, and it's even overridden a virtual function from that class as well. So, yes, I kind kind of knew about the majority of the things I've complained about before I started making this video. And there was a point to doing this stuff and including it in the video anyway and letting you hear me whining about it. I wanted newcomers to know that they are not alone when they encounter these kind of problems and frustrations. If you are new to development with either Unreal Engine or C++, and especially if you're one of the brave souls who is trying to learn both together, these kind of issues can really knock you on your backside and completely put you off trying to learn further. After all, you wanted to make your game, not mess around with a bunch of stuff that you think would be obvious but isn't. The good news is that it honestly does get easier in many ways. Unreal itself is much better than it used to be, even a couple of years ago. Epic are listening to people and they do improve things. Many things which used to be completely manual processes are now set up for you automatically. The official documentation is also getting better all the time, although it still has a way to go. There are many guides and tutorials available on the internet that are both official and unofficial. There's a good community of people and if you approach them in the right way they will often be very generous with their time and assistance. But like with any other type of software development you should at least try to read some documentation or find solutions yourself first rather than just expecting other people to fix things for you or write your code. Above all if you stick with it solving many of these niggly issues becomes almost second nature once you start to understand how unreal projects are structured and how the different files work together. You spend the majority of your time coding your game as opposed to trying to get it to compile. Okay, so in that spirit, let's go right ahead and fix the HUD class, and in the process, show you how Unreal class files work. I'll open the HUD bb.h file. There are some standard things in the top of the file. Pragma once should generally be the first line in all your header files, because it prevents you including them more than once, which would cause errors. We then have a few hash include lines. If you already know C++, this isn't new to you. These includes are used to tell the compiler that this file also depends on things defined in other files. What is specific to Unreal classes though is the last include line. It will always be the name of the header file plus dot generated dot h. Now that's important. It is telling the compiler to include that file even though you don't see it or edit it yourself. It is a file that the Unreal build process creates for you and that's an important point. If the header defines any U classes you must have that include and it must be the last include 
include in the list of includes. If you know C++, you already know that there is nothing stopping you from declaring a whole bunch of classes in the same header file, if that's what you want to do. Sometimes it's a matter of personal preference, and sometimes it might be useful for compilation reasons. Either way, you can still do that with Unreal if you want. Don't confuse the file name with the name of the Unreal classes you define inside those files. Now, when you create using those wizards to make your Unreal classes, they always create for you a new pair of files with the name of the class, usually without the Unreal prefix of U or A. Unreal Build Tool does not demand that these files only contain a single U class, and it doesn't actually care if any of the classes declared in the files have names which are the same as the file name. The file name is exactly that, it's just a file name. It just so happens that when you create a class with the wizard, it uses the name of your class to also name the file. Next, we come to U class. That's an Unreal Reflection macro call. And if you have followed my other videos, you know that all Unreal classes need it. It's a part of what tells the Unreal build tool that this is an Unreal class. The other part is a generated underscore body macro call, which is usually included in automatically generated classes as the first line in the class body. However, I personally like to group things in my classes first by public, then protected, and finally private. As generated underscore body has no scope specifier and it's the first line in the class, that's the same thing as private. So I create a private scope definition and I move it right to the very end of the class file. So far, I have never had any problems doing that in any version of Unreal. And thinking about it in the way that C++ works, there is no reason that it should actually cause an issue. However, I have seen some experts state that it should be the first line. So you do what you think is best. Okay, so the class declaration line, class building blocks underscore API, a HUD BB derives from public a character. This is saying that this class is called a HUD BB and it derives from a character. That's its parent class. It also has that project name underscore API macro before the class name. Seeing that bit tells you that this class is intended to be a public class, a class which other modules code can also use. For now, that doesn't matter to you. Watch video seven in this series to find out more about that. So the first thing we need to do is change the parent class to the one we are actually wanting to inherit from. In this case, we're making a custom HUD. So we need to inherit from a HUD. I make the change. Immediately, this causes other problems. Depending on which IDE you're using, it might tell you that it does not know what a HUD class is. This is because we have the wrong include file. We have game framework slash character dot H. And what we should have is game framework slash HUD dot H. I'll change that and that error goes away. The next error is on the virtual function override, set up player input component. And that's actually simple to understand and fix. That function is part of the a character class. A HUD doesn't have that function, and so you cannot override it. The fix? Delete it. In fact, let's delete all the code in this class, leaving only that generated body which is mandatory. And remember, we'll also need to do the same in the .cpp file. So however you made them, you should now have three pretty much empty classes which derive from a character, a player controller, and a HUD. Test that everything is okay by trying to build your solution. From either Visual Studio or Rider, on the menu, select Build, Build Solution, and let the compiler work its magic. If the project fails to compile, check the error log. While some errors can be a little cryptic and don't point to a specific line of code, many others do, and clicking the error in your IDE will often take you right to the offending line of code so you can correct the problem. Once the code compiles without problems, we can run it from the IDE. In Visual Studio, you click the green play button with local Windows debugger written next to it to run the game in the editor with the debugger attached. If you just want to run it without attaching the debugger, there is a green play button with an unshaded center right next to that. In Rider, it's either just a green play button to run the code without the debugger or a green insect bug icon to run it with the debugger attached. We don't really need the debugger right now, but it doesn't matter which one you choose. You should see your Unreal project splash screen, the default one, and eventually the editor will open. When the editor opens, likely as not, you won't see the level we made. You will most probably see that thing with the circular mountain ring again. 
The reason for that is that the settings for your project specify two maps, one which is the default map for the game and one which is the default map to open in the editor. At the moment, it's using default maps that come with the engine assets. Let's quickly change that so that it uses R1 instead. From the menu, select Edit Project Settings. Then on the left, near the top, under the project heading, click Maps and Modes. You can see there are entries for Editor Startup Map and Game Default Map. I'll use the drop down list and type DEF in the search. Then I select our default BB map and I'll do the same again for the game default map. It's not really important right now but whatever. With those set I'll close the project settings. Okay no point restarting the editor just to test that so I'll manually find the default BB map in the map folder and double click to open it. As I mentioned before unless you have a very compelling reason to create your own game mode derived class in C++ you can just make use of a blueprint one in the editor which makes it easier to change things without recompiling. I need to create that blueprint somewhere and it's not a map so I'll make a new folder in the content for it. In this case I'm just going to call it core. Inside that folder I'll right click and select new blueprint class and then choose game mode base from the list of common classes. In keeping with the robust naming scheme we have employed so far I'm going to call it game mode BB. That's right you heard me you asset naming commissars not BP underscore game mode BB not game mode BB underscore underscore BP, just game mode BB. Deal with it. I'll double click to open that new blueprint class and from its details I'll set player controller class to player controller BB, HUD class to HUD BB and default pawn class to character BB. I'll save that and close it. Okay, almost there. Look at the world settings for your map. If you don't have that open, it's available on the main menu, window, world settings. Right at the top in the section game mode is game mode override. Use the drop down to select the new one we just made, game mode BB. Phenomenal. So we set up our three currently empty classes and created a game mode blueprint which specifies them and told our map to use that. I have my editor, I can see the level we made and the nice flat plane floor, so I'll press that tempting play and editor button and Oh bugger, I seem to have fallen through space. Press either the red stop button or the escape key on the keyboard to stop the play and editor session. In your setup, you might not have fallen into infinity. If your camera was placed over the plane in the editor, then you would have landed onto it. By default, when you use play and editor, the game will spawn the player at the current camera location unless you somehow override that behavior. Probably the simplest and most intuitive way to do that is by adding a player start actor to the level. From the quick add menu, I choose basic, player start. Then I make sure that it is what is selected in the outliner and click that reset icon thingy next to the location property again to put it at the default 000 location. Hmm, that's not really great either because it's sort of half in the floor and half out of it. So I'll grab the blue up arrow in the 3D viewport and drag it up into the air a little bit. It's now floating above the floor, but it's easy to get it perfectly aligned with the floor. Just hit the end key on your keyboard. The selected actor drops until it hits something with collision on it, in this case the floor plane. Lovely. If you run play and editor again you should be spawned into our map standing exactly in the middle of the plane floor we made. But you will notice that you can't do anything. You can't move, you can't jump, you can't even look around. Because we've defined our own character and player controller which don't yet do anything that is pretty much to be expected. So we created a new minimalist project, added a similarly minimalist level map to it, and then we created three C++ classes that inherit from three of the Unreal Engine framework classes. We created a blueprint game mode and set it to use our three new classes, and then set our new level map to use that game mode and therefore those classes. Everything compiles and runs, even though it doesn't actually do much so far, it's a clean basis for learning more. The next step will be adding some player input, which we will do in the next video. Remember, if you want to chat about the things covered in this or any of my other videos or just talk about general game dev stuff, you'll find a link to the Discord server in the video description. So until next time, good luck with all your endeavours.